Welcome to the Cross Border Interviews. This is the show where we sit down with local elected leaders from all corners of Canada. Today, we are honored to be sitting down and speaking with Brandon Manitoba, Councillor Sean Cameron. Brandon is in the enviable position of being able to offer the best of both worlds, opportunity and sophistication of the metropolitan life within a stone's throw of quiet country living. The city of Brandon is the full service center boasting amenities and conveniences generally found in much larger centers. Brandon is a sports-oriented city full of top-notch recreational facilities with everything from hockey to English equestrian sports. Nicknamed the Wheat City in honor of its rich agricultural heritage, Brandon is a progressive community with a quality of life that must be experienced to be appreciated. So stay tuned and we'll be right back after a quick message with cross-border interviews featuring Councillor Sean Cameron. Are you passionate about local governance and municipal issues? Do you believe in the power of community-driven conversations? Then join us at the Cross Border Network, where we bring together voices from across Canada to shine a spotlight on the challenges and the triumphs of our municipalities. But we need your support to keep the conversation going. Visit crossborderinterviews.ca today to show your support by backing the show monthly or making a one-time annual donation. Your contribution will help us grow and expand our reach, bringing important stories to even more listeners across the nation. Together, we can make a difference. Together, we can amplify the voices of local communities. Together, we can shape a brighter future for all. Cross Border Network, where local matters and your support counts. Visit us today at crossborderinterviews.com. Counselor, thank you so much for doing this. Greatly appreciate it. I want to start by getting to know the sort of the persona behind the nameplate a little bit, if you don't mind. And I've got to ask a question I've asked every person who's ever come on the show, so you're no exception. Where did your sense of duty to serve your community come from, Sean? Yeah, absolutely. Well, I appreciate the opportunity to be on here today. Um, you know, I, I think as a lot of folks, it, it comes from your upbringing and uh, mine's really no exception. Uh, I grew up in a household that uh, my dad was a, a union leader and a union negotiator for uh, the steel workers and uh, UFCW when I was when I was a kid. So um, ultimately, uh, it was sort of being around that political world from the time I was little was just sort of ingrained to the kitchen table, right? So um, had that opportunity. And then my mom was a, a community hall volunteer. She she stepped in for our community center as a kid when it was going to close and, and kept the local rink open. Um, and from the time I was little, sort of, I had volunteered at that rink as well. So uh, we kept the local rink open in our, in our little small town at that time. And uh, it just sort of um, stuck with me ever, ever since then. And then Obviously, you get a little bit older and get into high school and and have that opportunity to get into, you know, topics like political science. And I had a, a couple of uh, uh, high school teachers that were really sort of influential in that and and keeping me uh, involved and, and asking the right questions. So it's always sort of been something that uh, was of interest to me and, and um, you know, just been really fortunate to be able to to serve the community in this capacity and 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 be able to um, take what I learned growing up and hopefully put that towards uh, you know serving and and building community here in Brandon. So why municipal? Because I I kind of have the same backstory as you a little bit because the, my my interest in politics really sparked in high school due to a few teachers just sort of ingraining that knowledge into me in those high school years, formative high school years, and I took it on to university, to college, and now to the show. But what was it about the municipal realm that sparked your interest? Because from your uh, stories, your mom was more of a local person uh, helping at the community hall, but uh, your dad with the union, that seems more of a uh, line towards provincial or even federal. What was it for you to decide to get into involved municipally in your first election in 2018? For sure. Yeah. Um, I, I, I did give a run at uh, municipal politics in 2011 um, or at uh, provincial politics in 2011, but uh, 
uh, wasn't successful there. But the one thing that I do like about municipal politics is um, it is the the level closest to the community, right? Um, and I think that's so important. And I think, you know, a number of your guests over the uh, your time have highlighted that, right? That um, municipal politicians have the ability to connect with people at the grocery store and have the ability to connect with people at the hockey rink or the curling rink. Uh, uh, you know, Brandon's a really big community for curling and, and there's a lot of, a lot of sort of municipal discussions I'm sure that happen over, over rinks throughout the community. Cause we are a winter city. Right. So, um, I just think that I, I like the municipal level of politics the most because there isn't a, there isn't for the most part, a partisan stripe to it. Um, which I think is is beneficial because you are you are making decisions that are are impacting the community, but you're also making decisions that are really informed by your community, and I I think that's just so key, right? And and that's what really attracted me to the municipal level, and I I think a lot of the councillors that I serve with are in that same boat. They they like the municipal level because they want the ability to have those discussions at the curling rink or at the coffee shop that are going to impact the city and and are going to um you know help us make decisions into the future that are are benefiting our city and and allowing it to continue to grow so what happened in 2018 for yourself to finally say okay i i tried my run provincially in 2011 but now yeah. i think the true focus that i should be putting in is through my community is serving on city council in brandon was there some issue going on in the community or was it people coming to you and saying uh sean we think you'd be a good voice all around that council table well, take me through your ultimate decision because at the end of the day you have to decide you can have people coming to you you have to make that decision what was that decision based on in 2018 for yourself yeah, it was a it was a couple of factors for sure that sort of brought me to that. Um, one, the 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 ward that I ran in, the current councillor that was in there, who I had a, a great deal of respect for, was was ready to retire. Um, so obviously, being a, a political animal, you look at open races as being the the uh, the best chance to kind of put your name forward. So, um, you know that that first and foremost was there. I had a number of discussions with folks in the community. Um, that had had encouraged me in 2014 as well to run and and it just wasn't really the right time at that time my family was still quite young um you know with my my youngest daughter only being 3 years of age at that time so uh wasn't really the right time at that time but in in 2018 they were a little bit older and I thought to myself you know I if if I ever want to step into this this ring so to speak and um be making decisions that make a community that they want to um, either call home or a community that if they leave and and go to do schooling or go to work somewhere, but they always feel that they can come back to because there's opportunity here. Um, so 2018 sort of was the uh, the line in the sand for me, and I I was really fortunate that my my family was really supportive and and my workplace and and all the sort of folks around me that helped uh, helped in 2018 there, and and I've I've never really forgot that. I uh, you know. I, I I found that as as a really big moment in in my life, and and I think um, you know it was because of those people that helped me get there that uh, uh, I continue to want to serve. I often don't ask this question on the show, but you bring up family, and I just want to play in that sandbox sure. for a few seconds here because um, yeah. the life of a counselor, unless you're in a large urban center like a major metropolitan area. It's a part-time job, but it is a full-time working job because you have a, your job on the side as well. You have your full-time job that you go to every day. But as the life of a yeah. city councillor is not just one meeting a week where you go and you go discuss things that are happening in your community. How important is it to have that strong backing of your family, your wife, your kids, so that way they they know that you're going to be potentially at a eight hour meeting or a six hour meeting on the weekends talking about budgets, and they will have to potentially pick up some of the things that you would traditionally do throughout the week that they would might have to do because you're going to be doing uh, business work from a counselor's perspective. Is it important to have that strong backing in the municipal realm? Absolutely. I, I don't think anyone should enter that world without it. Um, 
you know, honestly, and, and whether that's a family or whether that's just a support network of friends, if, if that's not the case. Right. Um, but I, I think it's just so in, integral, you know, my, my, my wife is, is, is my rock and, and continues to be right. Um, but she does pick up a lot. And the other thing that I think families don't maybe know getting into this, but find out really quickly is, is they become part of the decision-making process as well. In that uh, if a decision is controversial or if a decision is, uh, you know, uh, something that's going to make some waves in the community, they're going to hear about it as well. Um, <laughs> you know, the number of times that my my daughters have said that they've they've come back from class and and something that council has decided on or talked about has been part of a, a lesson that they've been involved with in the classroom or something that my wife will run into someone at the grocery store or, or, or work and they will say, you know, that they have, you know, a point of view on this and and she always just sort of comes back to talk to Sean. Right. Um, but family is, is so key. They are, they are uh, your ultimate support network, but at the same time you have to enter into this world knowing that they are going to be to a certain extent exposed to the political world as well. And, and, the good and the bad, right? Um, you know, obviously we we as a council are, are making some bigger moves right now that, um, you know, are going to create some waves, but there are moves that I think as a, as a whole, we feel are necessary to ensure that the city um, is in a good position moving forward. And and family will feel the ripple of that. And they'll uh, they'll ultimately, they'll encounter it in, in some of the strangest places, but at the same time, they, they, uh, you know, they just roll with it. Our, our kids, uh, you know, when I, in 2018, I, one of my most cherished photos up in my office here is, is my kids campaigning with me and, and, uh, our littlest there, she was, she was five at the time and, and the oldest was seven and, and we're, um, you know, standing on the corner and I've, I've kind of got my arms around both of them and they both got a handful of pamphlets. So I, I hope that, you know, moving forward when when I'm older and, and I'm out of this and, and they maybe want to consider doing something like this, that they'll remember back how important uh, how important it was to me. And and hopefully they have that same level of service built into them that they want to want to see their their community grow and prosper. It seems like you have a strong support system with your wife, your kids, the people around you. What advice would you give that first term counselor who has that support system, but is trying to navigate these. Uh, and I don't want to say choppy, turbulent waters, but you're right. The decisions you make impact people. And I can imagine after six years, you, you realize that you're not going to please a hundred percent of the people on the decisions mm -hmm. you make, even as something is so small to something as big as taxes, you're never going to please a hundred percent of the people. What advice would you give that new family, that father, that mother, who's about, who's entering into the political arena who says, I wish I had the sort of knowledge that Sean has now so that way I can navigate this in the correct fashion. Yeah, for sure. Um, you know, the one thing that uh, in both the terms that I've been on in council that we've we've done and I think is a really good thing is we set up a, a council mentorship program. Um, so when a new counselor comes on board, they're paired with a, a veteran counselor, so to speak, right? And I, I, I grew up in sports and in and around sports. So I always kind of joke that you get paired with an old defensive man, right? So you get the defensive pairing where you have somebody that has sort of played the game for a long time, right? I think one of the, the things that I could say as far as advice for um, people getting into the realm is just to ensure that you kind of compartmentalize each decision. Um, and I, I'll broaden on that a little bit in that, that you don't think of one decision being sort of a make or break for you that, the you know, people are going to, um, turn sour to, you know, your, your approach based on a singular decision, right? A lot of times people, when they are responding to something that might be controversial, the very next one, you might say something that they support and people are generally in our community quite good at um you know giving folks the benefit of the doubt and know the knowing that we're serving with the best interests in mind um so that would be my my advice to a new council member is just to 
talk it out and and have those opportunities where you lean on your peers and and it might be another new counselor um you know we were really fortunate in the 2022 election um to have four new council members join because of uh retirements and and one defeat um but those uh those four councillors joining uh um really brought a new perspective to our community and really brought a new perspective to our council and i think having the a new mayor join as well you know brought another perspective that was different from before albeit that uh mayor Fawcett and i both sh uh served on the previous council together right but it just um you know leaning on the people around you and and the other thing too is just to uh utilize the staff that are there you know we're we're tremendously fortunate in the city of Brandon to have a lot of capacity and a lot of professional capacity among our staff. Um, so having the uh, ability to reach out and use those professionals, because we're we're not right. We're not. Um, I'm not a professional architect. I'm not a professional um, engineer. But I always I always kind of joke. It's a little like the show Pawn Stars. I know I could call a guy right, um, and. Uh, very quickly connect with somebody that does right um and i always joke you know in that show where they always have an expert just sort of waiting in the wings that just through the magic of television appears right um and 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 that's sort of like council as well right we we can reach out to some of these uh the amazing staff that we have at the city of brandon that are are just a wealth of knowledge and are willing to serve the community and serve our residents and and we're really fortunate to have that so there's so many questions. I want to use the analogy of Pawn Stars right now of like asking who's the pops of the council, who's the chumbly of the council, but I won't yeah. because that's not the, yeah. the shows. I, I want to talk yeah. about that, that thing you just mentioned there about relying on the experts. That I, I agree, that's important, but there's also another facet that we often don't talk about a lot, but you as a counselor have to rely on the motion, the advice that administration is giving you, but you also have to go out to the general public and ask for their input as well to get a sense of where the community is. Do you get a sense in Brandon after six years that people are willing to give you the advice that you were looking for, whether it be for something, against something, or is there an apathetic nature in Brandon that as long as the water's turned on and the garbage is picked up, we really don't, aren't paying attention. And I say this knowing that last week, as of recording this, you just went through a public open house and you had some feedback from the general public. But besides those public hearings, will people stop you at the grocery store and talk to you about the issues that are going on in the city? Yeah, for the most part, I would say they will. Um, it, most times it is very sort of granular though. Um, so the, the issue that you'll get stopped on is, you know, the fact that maybe the, the garbage didn't get picked up properly this week or a back lane needs graded, right? So it's really at a granular level. The one thing that we're trying to do though at the city though right now is we're having a lot of bigger discussions that are, are far reaching are 30 years into the future, like our city plan discussion that, that brought out a lot of, of people to, to voice their opinion. But the, the, the problem with something like that was, is it still came back to the discussion being about taxation in a single year. Um, and, and I think we need to, uh, as a community, continue to find ways to have these broader strokes of, um, we have to have discussions on what does the city look like 10 years down the road, 30 years down the road, 50 years down the road, because as a city, we got to ensure that we're planning for those um, eventualities, right? So it's it's trying to balance the sort of granular um, everyday discussions that come up, the pothole, the um, bump in the road, the curb that maybe got tore up by a grader versus a bigger discussion. And, and, a lot of times we won't have those be the things that someone will come up to you in the grocery store on. Um, so we do try to have a lot of, of public engagement, uh, open houses, that sort of thing. It's just ensuring that those don't get um, uh, trumped there again with the the singular discussions around, um, you know, municipal issues that are, are sort of day-to-day -day occurrences.
so before we continue down this line of questioning, I just yeah. want to preface this as, as I always do. This is a conversation between the counselor and myself. This is not a motion of counsel. This is not a policy of counsel. This is not a no. direction <laughs> of counsel. Just want to make sure I put that on the record before we start discussing some of the issues that are going on in the community. Yeah. But I want to go yeah. back to that statement that you just said there, because I agree the municipality should be looking at the larger picture, the future, the third next 30 years instead of the here and now. But the residents are here and now. They're the ones who are dealing with the issues that they believe, and you say gran, uh, uh, granular, but at the same time, they're thinking that that's the most important issue to them. That, that taxation, mm -hmm. that pothole, that service level is so important to them. That's why they're voicing it. How do you balance that local individual issue and yes i'm going to quote spock here as i always do on the show but how do you balance the needs of the many with the needs of the few or even the one because that one person as much as they might have believe that that is the most important issue you're their elected official in ward four or whatever ward you represent in brandon that they're coming to you for a reason so how do you balance the needs of the community with that individual because at the end of the day the municipality only has a certain amount of money Absolutely. Um, and uh, I, I I think any politician that said that they had the perfect science around that is 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 lying, right? Um, but what what I what I think it is is just ensuring that you're you're always sort of, you know, coming back to that sports analogy that you're keeping an eye on what the fourth quarter might look like while you're playing in the first quarter, right? Um, so having those those, individual issues just to ensure that you're doing as much as you can to have the follow-up on them and uh i'm the first to admit that uh it's it's not perfect right um but on those individual issues it's ensuring that you get a timely response back to residents and and residents are are great in the sense that that's a lot of times what they're they're looking for first and foremost right is that just you acknowledge an issue and that you um, provide them with with a response, and and sometimes they may not like the response, but at the end of the day, they they get a response, right? Um, because some of the issues that they are bringing forward, you can't action or or complete or provide sort of um, sort of a, a a finish line for them in the near near future, right? So um, balancing that with the 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 needs long term. And I think that's that's one of the things that our our council does really well is is um, you know all our our councilors are very cognizant in our in our reactions and discussions with with citizens that we are balancing those those day to day issues and and bringing them up in a timely manner and and ensuring that they're they're being dealt with while also looking long term and and that's where our city's at right now is some of these bigger long term discussions, whether it be, um, you know, the expansion of our water treatment plant, whether it be the work that's going on in the southwest of our city that looks at the growth potential, whether it's um, drainage work that's going on in the southeast of our city, like we have uh, a lot of bigger sort of balls in the air right now that, um, you know, as, as a counselor, you just have to maintain that balance and ensure that you're not making decisions that are just reactionary for today. I think that's one one place that um, <clears throat> councils of any stripe in any community can be can be blamed for is is we're political creatures. We live in sort of four year cycles. Um, we could make a lot of decisions today that would benefit us in twenty twenty six in an election time, but it may not or would not benefit the city as a whole. So it's important that we're making those decisions that. Um, you know, at the end of the day in, in 2026, that if, if, if we weren't brought back or if we were to move on, that we could walk away saying, you know, we made the right decision for the city as a whole, as opposed to the right decision in the here and now that would uh, get us closer to the ball in 2026. So speaking of the here and now, it begs the question, in your opinion, and again, this is your this is the conversation between the two of us and not a motion of counsel. In your opinion, yep. what is the biggest issue that you believe is facing the city of Brandon here and now or issues? Yeah, there's a couple of them for sure. Uh, I think one of the biggest issues that's facing us right now is a housing crunch. Um, 
you know, and, and that's something that I think is a, impacting municipalities uh, across the nation right now. Um, you know, the, the federal government has come out with a $4 billion uh, housing accelerator fund recently, of which did the, you guys get the city some of was that? six. Yeah, you yeah, guys we were did, successful. Yeah. yeah, yeah, we did get some of it. Uh, so the city was successful and it, and it, it comes in waves though, that it does have a, a number of benchmarks that you do have to, uh, uh, adhere to. So we were, we were successful on the, on the first wave of it, but housing is a huge need in the city being that the city of Brandon is, is very much, um, has moved away from the, the sort of small agricultural city to being very much a regional hub for the, the Western part of the province. Um, you know, obviously, uh, Winnipeg is, 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 the lion's share of funding, um, as they often say in the post-secondary world, um, you know, 85% of the provincial dollars are spent uh, post-secondary wise in Winnipeg and 15% in the rest of the province. And, and I would say from a municipal standpoint, we're not much different. Um, so we're, we're, we're trying to balance some of the big needs being a regional hub in that people come to us for, uh, the social challenges, people come to us for health, for services, retail. Um, and we're we're trying to balance that crunch with um uh you know the 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 realities of our our costs and our ability to to gain traction on housing. So that's a, a real big one. Um, you know, cost of living always comes to play, right? And and this year, you know, obviously with some bigger tax increases it challenges cost of living and we're we're cognizant of that and and understand that um but at the same time it it's there again comes back to that balance of ensuring that we're positioning the city for success long term and then the third one i would say is a big one is infrastructure um you know the the this as as any municipality across canada is dealing with right we have uh uh, aging infrastructure. We have a city that a lot of our our um, underground work dates back to the 1960s and prior. Um, so it's it's coming of age all at once, which um, you know maybe isn't the best uh, best thing because you are then replacing those pipes underground and you're replacing that infrastructure, but you're replacing them at today's dollars, knowing that you're going to have to finance them long term at tomorrow's cost, right? So. Um, it's, it's, it's a number of things, but, uh, I, I think, you know, we, we still do our best to try and, um, you know, ensure that the city remains uh, a viable entity and, and the costs remain within range for people. So uh, correct me if I'm wrong here, but the only reason I know this is because I'm coming to Brandon later on it, like literally the day this is airing April 8th. I am going to be in Brandon, Manitoba. Correct me if I'm oh, wrong, excellent, but on April 8th at seven o'clock in council meetings, you're going to be talking about the sort of the financial future of the city. So a, I'm looking forward to that, but this is a conversation <laughs> that's kind of timely in some sense. Um, yeah, you're right. Things are getting more expensive as we are talking, literally the costs that you're getting projected are not the costs that are going to be the reality 10 years down the line. So you have to do a lot of these major infrastructure improvements, major changes to uh, the delivery of services, because like you so eloquently said, more and more municipalities are dealing with more provincial issues, but at a municipal level, because the funding's mm -hmm. just not there. And I'm not saying that just because you're, I'm talking to a Manitoba uh, councillor, I would having, I'd be having this exact same conversation in Alberta, New Brunswick, Newfoundland, Ontario, across this country, more and more municipalities are dealing with issues that are not in their jurisdictional purview. How do you do that? And I'm, I'm kind of asking a million dollar question in a 45 minute interview, knowing that we're already <laughs> a half hour in, but how do you balance the needs of the the here and now? Because people are struggling, but the reality is you have to start planning today because if you don't, 10 years down the line, these infrastructure, whether it be pipes, roads, are going to be in worse disrepair than they currently are, and it's going to cost even more. So do you see yourself as a councillor and as council, as a royal council, sort of balancing the sort of the challenges that the financial situation you're under 
with the realities that you can't just do it on the backs of the people who are here because they're already struggling as well. I think uh, one of the things that we've, we've been really fortunate, um, you know, in, in this term for sure is, is our mayor is very active um, in Winnipeg. Right. And, and you have to spend a lot of time in the hallways of the legislature or um, in, in the offices in Winnipeg, right. Because we, we need to be able to action the province on the, on these initiatives and, and ensure that the province is a, is a willing and able partner. And, and we've been really fortunate, um, no matter the stripe of government that Brandon has always had the ear of, of the province. It's just ensuring that that continues. And then at a federal level, as every municipality struggles with, um, you know, I, I I heard one of your episodes a while back with Mayor Siemens who um, from Winkler, um, and he was talking about having those discussions at the federal level. I'm sure they're they're hearing from every every municipality around that is in in a tough position. So it's ensuring that you do everything you can to advocate up the chain um, to to make sure that the need is there you know one of the one of the big growth projects that we've had underway in the city for a couple of years now is is expansion of our water treatment plant um and it's it's one of the core initiatives that a city should provide and and be good at providing right if you don't do garbage and you don't do water well as a city you've been derelict to your residents right so um, you're forgetting something we, though as well yeah, if I hate to interject, but you're always it's no. always forgotten that snow removal is one of the key necessities for <laughs> all municipalities. And if you don't do it well, you will hear from every single one of your residents that you don't do it well. Yeah, absolutely. We did, we had uh, <laughs> recently we had a storm over two days that dropped uh, 45 centimeters of snow on the city of Brandon and in sort of one well two shots but one significant one and then one that followed within um 24 hours right so that's another thing as well yeah yeah you, you have to be be prepared for those but um you know we we getting back to the water treatment there you know we we were really fortunate to have you know that project is north of uh, 140 million dollars um and that's something that as a city we could never cover uh, on our own. It's just too big of uh, too big a, a chunk to to bite off. So we do have federal partners and and provincial partners on that. and and that is really a, a testament to to our staff uh, at the city ensuring that they had those conversations. We have to ensure that every grant dollar that is available out there, we're putting our name down and saying, hey, we want a a piece of this because, um, in absence of that, it becomes very difficult for cities to, uh, you know, make ends meet, so to speak, right? And and I think a lot of times looking at a city at a at a micro level, like you would your household, right? There's there's a lot of wants in our community right now that we would love to have, right? You know, uh, one of the ones that always comes to mind and comes to the top of of um, you know the discussions is water parks in the city of Brandon, right? And ultimately, that's a, a, a twelve to fifteen million dollar price tag. And and as much as we'd love to to do that, there are some core services we have to ensure that we're providing ahead of that. I know it it is is part of a quality of life, and it's part of um, you know ensuring that a, holistically that our city is is you know has has those really neat opportunities, but. We have to balance that and and much like you would in a household, if you had, uh, whether you wanted the, the big screen TV or you wanted a hot water heater, unfortunately, when the hot water heater goes, you have to replace it as much as you'd love the big screen TV. It, it, it's about balancing those priorities, right? Do the people of Brandon understand that though? Because they they will come to you with all their very and I say micro issues because we just talked about some of the issues that they have that they believe are important. But at the end of the day, they're they are micro on the grand scheme of things compared to a wastewater tr treatment facility, a water plant that needs upgraded core infrastructure that needs to be improved. 
the decisions that you're making, do you get a sense that the community has bought into the sort of the uh, the idea of what Brandon is going to look like in the future? Because you can't just do this on the decisions that you make around that table. You have to make sure that your path that you have carved out for the city reflects the needs and wants of the community, whether that be more housing, because I can imagine there's NIMBYism is alive and well in all parts of this country, and I'm assuming mm-hmm. it's live and well in Brandon. Do you get a sense that the people of Brandon are supportive of the path that the council is taking around issues and around these major infrastructure projects? Because if you don't have buy-in from the residents, then you're just sort of turning your wheels at the end of the day, aren't you? Yeah, for sure. I, I think we're getting there. Um, no, nobody's perfect for sure. And, and I'd be the first to admit, and, and I think most of council would be the first to admit that we're not, uh, we, we haven't approached this perfectly, right? One of the things that I think we need to do, and we always talk about this, but we need to ensure we're doing is, is at the earliest possible time, communicating the importance of these decisions to residents and hearing their feedback. Right. And, and, you know, a lot of times that feedback may not be positive and, and that's okay. That's, that comes with the territory, so to speak. Right. Um, but I think we're, we're getting there. Um, th- this council, as opposed to some in the past and one that I was involved with previously has really made some, some big moves. Um, and, and one of our strategic pillars when, when this council was elected that, you know, we got together and put together a strategic plan. And, and one of the things that we talked about was, was being bold. Um, and we, we are very much a, um, a conservative, um, region, right? We are, we're conservative, not in the political stripe, but in the ideology, like ideological stripe, right? In that we, we measure decisions and we measure decisions over time and that sort of thing. And, and one of the things that we approach this term is to, to make some bold moves. So we looked at a growth strategy. We looked at a city plan that, you know, municipally is, is mandated by the provinces to do, but we could have just purely come out with a city plan that said, you know, here are the very basic levels that we need to attain as a city to sort of meet the municipal regulation requirement for this. But uh, we challenged our staff and our, our staff definitely delivered on saying, you know, this is what our city could look like. This is what it's going to cost, but this is what our city could look like. And I think that um, is, is a real game changer. Ultimately, you know, if, if, the the proof will be in the pudding if 10 years from now people look back and say you know that the the council from from 2022 to 2026 really set the city on a, a good footing moving forward um you know i'm hopeful that's the case uh i think we are making the the right decisions right now um bringing residents along though is is so important in that discussion and and making sure that they have every opportunity to voice their feedback, ask the questions and, and sort of look at all these documents as never sort of ironclad, that they're, they're growing, they're living documents, they're living plans, that cities as we grow, will continue to inform on and and make sure that we're, um, you know, looking at the city plan might be different five years from now than it is the document that we're creating right now. But knowing that residents always have the ability to be with us on that on that journey is is incredibly important. Um, I'm cautious of time here, but I have a few more questions I yeah. want to ask. Do you mind yeah, if I'm taking an extra ten minutes? Okay, perfect. Now I love it. Yeah, absolutely. I, I've been accused on this show, and if you've listened to the show before, you know that I, I bring this up a lot because I want to make sure that the person who accused me knows that I'm asking this question now. <laughs> um, I've been accused on this show that I only talk about the negative things, about the challenges that municipalities are faced with right now. In your opinion, what are the things that you talk about the most when it comes to the city of Brandon? What are the, what is the issues? What are the cha- the accomplishments that you boast about when you talk to other municipal leaders across Canada, across Manitoba, or even to your own neighbors? What is the thing that's going on in the city that you say, you know what, other cities might be doing it well, we're doing it better? Yeah, absolutely. I think um, one of the things that I I will 
boast about. And it's not something that even comes from a, a purely cost investment standpoint, but we are an incredibly welcoming community. Um, you know, over the past number of years, we've welcomed uh, thousands of newcomers to our community, right? You look at, at the city of Brandon, um, you know, if you look back 10 to 12 years ago, our population has has gone from about 40,000 to a little over 50,000. And a, a big amount of that growth has come from newcomers to Canada. Um, and I think that sort of cultural mosaic that we've created in Brandon now, um, with with having those newcomers come here, I think has, has been a game changer. We've moved from being um, thought of, like I say, as that... Um, sort of conservative mindset, agricultural based community to this sort of um, cultural mosaic of, of every different stripe from around the world. And, and they, they bring so much to the community that um, aside from just population, but they, they, they bring so much as far as making sure that we are a community that is progressive and diverse and, and takes into account all these um, different ideologies and this sort of world perspective that comes to play in this tiny um, city in Manitoba, right? So uh, that is something that I will boast to the end of days about is is how how much our community has has embraced newcomers and and how much they value they've brought to to our city. Um, if if I was to say, you know, to somebody outside our community that was was looking to locate to Brandon, you know, uh, Brandon's Brandon's been my home, uh, you know, since since I was young. Uh, I grew up here. I I lived for a little bit uh, just west of Brandon, sort of a five minute drive, and then and then moved back in at the earliest opportunity. Right, so um, it's always been my home. It's a it's a great place to to raise a family. Um, you know, we have our challenges, as I think every municipality does, but uh, for the most part, we're a safe community. Um, you know, we we still have the ability that people can can make a living here. We we have industry here. We're always looking to attract more. And and those are discussions that are ongoing with with various partners, provincial and and otherwise. Right. Um, so I think there's a lot of opportunity in the future here. And, and I'm just hopeful that. Um, what we're doing here today will, uh, you know, we're 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 planting the seeds that'll bear fruit bear fruit uh, in the in the near future and and for a long term moving out. So, I appreciate that. Now I want to talk about my favorite subject. Now the only reason yeah. I'm asking this question is because I like to visit communities, and as I said earlier on in the interview, I'm going to be in Brandon not just for one day, but I'm going to be in Brandon for five days, and I. Imagining oh, I'm going to be needing things to do in Brandon besides attend the upcoming Albert Association of Manitoba Municipalities Conference, which is being hosted in yep. Brandon, Manitoba this year. So on Absolutely. my afternoons and my evenings, what are some of the hidden gems that tourists need to do when they are in Brandon, Manitoba? Yeah, absolutely. Um, there is a, there is a world of possibility <laughs> here as far as, uh, food and entertainment and uh every everything in between obviously you'll be at uh the Keystone Center for AMM which is one of our our biggest regional hubs uh you know we're really hopeful at that time that the Brandon Wheat Kings will still be in the playoffs so um you know you you mentioned Brandon outside of the city of Brandon and everybody comes back with Wheat Kings right uh, it is so uh synonymous with our our brand so to speak so we're really hopeful that the wheat kings will still be playing uh you know we have the westman centennial auditorium which i'm i'm fortunate to be the board chair of the auditorium board uh and uh there's always a number of shows that are on any given week there that uh you'd be able to to take into um as far as the, there's lots of food opportunities through uh, food opportunities abound um you could uh you could hit up definitely in the downtown any any given day for breakfast. Uh, 
uh, Derek and his his uh, folks there at Comfort Kitchen. I I see the nod there. You've <laughs> uh, you've been to Comfort Kitchen for sure. Uh, Shay Angela. I, 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 when I was spot. driving through last year, I had to stop, and I was stopped in Brandon for a few minutes, and I went downtown. It was a Saturday morning, about nine o'clock, and uh, the smells that I smelt downtown. I'm looking forward. Let's put it this way: <laughs> I have not got there, but I will get there. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. Comfort Kitchen, uh, Shea Angela, which is de- just down on 10th Street, another local uh, uh, opportunity to to check out local fare. We have uh, the Dock on Princess, which is a big sort of nightlife area. Uh, we have a couple of brew pubs downtown. Um, you know, you look a little bit further up the street and you have places like Saber Latino uh, and and all the sort of ethnic flair that is, has come into sort of the the culinary aspects of our city as well. So you definitely won't leave Brandon hungry, which is uh, is good as well. But um, there there's any number of opportunities to to take in um, take in the community and and really experience it. You know, we have uh, two two really viable and and vibrant post secondary communities in uh, Cinnaboyne Community College and Brandon University, um, and they always have lots of offerings both day and evening that have, uh, um, you know, Brandon University is is home to a, a renowned music school. So there's there's always potential offerings there and then uh, some great athletics offerings from the college and, and university as well. So uh, definitely there won't be a shortage. So hopefully uh, during your visit, uh, you don't leave hungry and, and you have the opportunity to, to be entertained in, in your downtime as well, so. So correct me if I'm wrong here, because I, I think I read this on Brandon Tourism, and I'm I'm not saying this because I want to go, but I'm saying this because I want to go yeah. a little bit. Saying this, um, you guys have one of the best observatories in uh, in Manitoba as well through one of your universities as well. So for those who it's the Brandon University, correct, or is it the Assiniboine College? That's that's correct. Yeah, Brandon okay. University Observatory. Yeah. So for anyone who's in Brandon University is listening to this episode right now, and is looking for someone to come out and check out their observatory because I'm not sure if it's admitted by public or just to the students. I would love to come out and see. So there's my little shameless plug for those who are listening from Brandon yeah. University. Wink, wink, nudge, nudge. We'll, uh, we'll, we'll connect you with uh, Dr. David Doherty, uh, who is the president at Brandon University, and I'm sure he'd be help, uh, happy to help you 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 get in there. But um, yeah, we, just, we have a lot of... Uh, opportunity just even in Brandon in and around Brandon that has uh has some really great options the other one that I'll I'll point out if if you're an aviation fan by any means um one of the one of the big ones in Brandon is the Commonwealth Air Training Plan Museum and um it is a it is a larger museum and it's one of the the gold star attractions in Manitoba and it's it's located up at our airport but was uh part of the uh uh, Canadian arm of the British Commonwealth training plan during the Second World War. So there are a number of uh, planes um, in a hangar there that they're working with the federal partners right now to get some some funding to help shore up. Um, but there are a number of World War II planes and, and uh, um, uh, paraphernalia and such from the Second World War. And, and for the, the right price, they'll even take you up in a tiger moth. Uh, and you can fly in a in a tiger moth up there, and we've had the opportunity in the past, and it's a uh, it's a fun, albeit harrowing, experience. So, uh, yes, please. Even though my husband is probably <laughs> listening to this right now, going, if he gets in an airplane, he better not, because he is prone to every type of accident. I will fall upstairs for God's <laughs> sakes. Um, I yeah, gotta ask though, yeah. for you. Where do you go in the community after a long day of work, after a long day of council meetings? Is there a spot that you go to decompress in your community? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, I, I like I say, I'm I'm a big fan of. Uh, I've I've always been in a, in and around sports, so uh, I generally like I say, I love I love Wheat Kings games. I love uh, I love hockey, but hockey has is a love, but football is a passion. Um, so I really love this sort of summer, fall time of year coming up because uh, I I absolutely love football. So there's all kinds of youth football, high school. Uh, we have a senior men's team that plays here uh, as well. So there's all sort of ages to see that. And then as far as nightlife, um, 
I've, I've been really fortunate to have a, a group of friends that for 20 plus years now we've met on and off on a Tuesday evening. And, and, uh, my sort of go-to is the, is the dock on princess, um, which is, a uh, uh, a sort of local pub uh, on Princess Avenue, as the name would uh, suggest, and that's kind of my go-to if uh, if I want uh, uh, a chance to unwind and just sit and visit with friends. So yeah, that's my 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 two go-tos. Well, hopefully, when I'm in Brandon that this week, as of this airing, we'll be able to go to the dock on Princess and grab a brew, and I'll grab a coffee, and we'll just relax and continue this conversation. Oh, I'd People- love it. Before I let you go, I have one last question. And it's the million dollar question sure. that ends all this interview. We started by talking about yourself. We're ending by talking about the city of Brandon. In your opinion, yep. I think we got to a little bit in the last segment, but I want to talk about a little, a little bit more. What makes the city of Brandon such a unique place to live, to work, and to raise a family counselor? Uh, I would say what makes the city of Brandon unique is that we are just the right size. Um, and I know it's 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 almost feels a little bit uh, like a, like some sort of inside joke, right? But um, we are are big enough to have some of the regional offerings that people need, like uh, like a really high class hospital, like uh, two post secondary institutions in Assiniboine Community College, Brandon University. Um, so it gives us that kind of college town feel in a lot of ways. Um, but we're also small enough to still feel like you know your neighbors, um, to still feel like you can get from one end of the city to the other in, you know, 10 minutes drive type thing, right? So we're, I always kind of joke that we're kind of just the right size, right? Um, and I think that's what makes us unique is <clears throat> it's also one of the things that challenges us at times is because we have a lot of wants that potentially a city of 80,000 people would have, but um, we're still at 50,000. So we're right at that kind of sweet spot right now that I think uh, works really well for us. Um, you know, we have an a, aggressive growth plan, um, but I still think will keep us feeling like, you know, you could have, um, you know, one person living on one side of the city and one person living on the other and still feel like they're neighbors. Counselor, I want to thank you. This has been A, a fantastic interview, B, enlightening, and C, I'm so glad that your mayor, Jeff Fawcett, uh, uh, suggested that I reach out to you and come on the show. This has been uh, fantastic, and it's a great way to sort of showcase Brandon because this will be airing the day I'm arriving in Brandon, so <laughs> hopefully we can meet. I'm going to be at your uh, uh, April 8th uh, council meeting because I want to see how you guys operate through, not through YouTube, too, but in person. So it's going to be interesting. Yeah. And I'm looking forward to meeting you in person. So thank you so much. Well, thank you so much for the opportunity, Chris. You know, it, uh, it, it's it's through work um, like you're doing here that um, brings exposure to um, municipal affairs issues that um, I think any way possible that people can can get connected and, and learn more about what the important issues are to their community and what the important issues are to municipalities as a whole is, is, is incredibly important. So thank you very much for your work and, and the opportunity to be on here. Now, if today's episode sparked your interest, hit that subscribe button now. Stay in the loop with all our diverse content covering everything from municipal affairs to our in-depth conversations here on the cross-border interviews and even our eye-opening exploration on the decisions local governments make in the political trenches, local government at work. We are your go-to platform for comprehensive municipal coverage committed to keeping you well-informed as well as engaged. Your support is the backbone of our growth and the maintenance of this top-notch content you have come to enjoy. If you can, consider backing the show. Every contribution, big or small, amplifies the depth and the breadth of our programming. Find the support page link on the Cross Border Interviews website today. Until next time, stay informed, stay engaged, and most importantly, just keep talking.